What ho, darlings? Now don't forget to like, subscribe, share, and all that good stuff. Oh, I'm in this one too. Huzzah! <laughs> so a few weeks ago, I asked you guys on Instagram what were the most obvious non-illegal cash grabs when it comes to watches. Your comments were, of course, insightful, varied, even controversial at times, but above all, interesting. Today, we analyze some of them to try and figure out the good from the bad, while also looking at several new releases, including a world-exclusive first look at an exciting and important GMT watch. So let's get into it. Okay, hi guys, and welcome to the show. I'll do a very quick wristwatch check wearing the gold Amiga Seamaster from 1956 with that in-house amazing caliber 500. It's on a Nizza strap from, uh, I believe it's Fluco. I should know this by now. Uh, you can get these from Holbens. I just think the gold and the suede, absolute pure class together. There's something very regal about it. And of course, it matches today's Garnet's pinky ring. I know, I'm completely ridiculous. Anyway, let's get on with the video, shall we? In one sense, everything is a cash grab. Without getting into a whole speech like the ending of the film Network and telling you to atone, invariably it is part of life that we have to accept. It is ebb and flow, tidal gravity. It is ecological balance. But when does it become too much and breaks the camel's back? As always, it's not as simple as black and white. One of the most talked about brands in your responses was Amiga and their endless limited editions. And more surprisingly, even from fans of the brand. One could be forgiven for thinking that Amiga bankrolled the whole Apollo mission themselves with how much they bang on about it. From the insanely priced high-end speedies with cartoon characters that collectors lap up to plastic Happy Meal toy moon swatches that blew our minds more recently. Marketing genius, sure, but especially ironic to think that the most numerous watches actually worn in space is now various Casios. And then when the Speedy failed on a moon watch, the Bull of a Lunar Pilot took its place. A brand, as discussed before, that without their Accutron technology of the 1960s, the space race would have undoubtedly have been lost. But perhaps their most egregious cash grab was yet another Bond watch, even when James Bond himself, I apologize for the spoilers, had been whacked in the ending of No Time to Die, and we are years away from another episode in the franchise, let alone a new actor to play 007. Then there are watch brands doing movie collabs the right way. Recently, if you haven't noticed, uh, there's a new Indiana Jones movie. Talk about cash grabs, did we, really, <laughs> did we really need one? But anyway, at least the watch casting is pretty good in this one. I loved the original classic trilogy, and Harrison Ford is indeed a legend. And this time it's Hamilton, who are one of the first brands ever to cleverly use the silver screen to promote their watches since the 1930s. In fact, they have been in more movies than we have time to discuss today. Apparently, from what I understand, they don't pay in the traditional product placement way of doing things that often breaks the fourth wall. Take, for example, Panerai in the lackluster, unwanted reboot of Death Wish. Paul is eating breakfast with his wife Lucy while complaining about his watch running slow. Sorry to say, but the ones directed by Michael Winner and starring Charles Bronson, turning people into human pate with a bazooka, will always be the best Death Wish movies. Stay just like that. You can't have both of us. That's the best part about that scene, is the burning carcass that's just lying in the middle of the street. <laughs> <laughs> wow. But I've been looking for this all my life. Mm 
Morton have a knack for great watch casting, delving deep into their extensive archives to make something special, usually based on the version of that style to fit the era or theme of the movie. This time it's the Art Deco inspired Bolton that was selected. Perfect for the all American 1930s style squash buckling adventurer, a movie franchise and watch that shares so many common stylistic tropes. The fact that it's a quartz dress watch I think makes sense for the fans, makes it certainly more accessible if you're not necessarily into watches but want something involved in the franchise. Yeah, I could see him wearing the original, which I think is the whole point. I love quartz dress watches. I don't wear them that often to justify the high prices. For me, the biggest negative when it comes to this charming little hammy is the puzzling fact it's based on the watch originally produced from 1940 to 1952 but in the movie set in the post-war period, it makes it an anachronism. Then again, I have not seen the movie yet, so I might be wrong, because as we all know, Quartz Technology was first released in 1969, so let's hope the one in the movie is an original mechanical version. I love the shape of the case, this tourneau-shaped case, the way it curves in the case back and the sapphire, follows the curvature of your wrist, fantastic and it's relatively modestly sized they've got it spot on substantially larger than the original that's when men wore really tiny little watches even the strap is great so yeah obviously i mean i love the color look at that love the color yeah then there are trends that come and go kind of like the fashion world that then other watch brands seem to be overly quick to jump on and exploit often leaving a bit of a sour taste for us collectors the Rolex hype is perhaps the prime example here, and I've discussed it to death, so I'm not going to repeat myself. And then there's the allegedly manipulated scarcity of supply and price gouging by marked up fashion watches using designer names with cheap quartz movements. And this is all nothing new. But a more recent example mentioned by you guys numerous times was the Tiffany dial craze. The colloquial name for the light robin egg blue colour associated with the luxury brand Tiffany & Co. A craze started by an auction of a very rare watch that had this previously overlooked pastel colour. I still don't really get it myself, but indeed it is a thing. Personally, I hope that trend will die, and I'm sure it will, but let me know other trends that you're not a fan of in the comments. But beyond mere colour, then there are trends like this, the Genta-inspired 70s sports watch with the integrated bracelet, brutalist shapes, uh, all inspired by his couple of all of the, the Royal Oak and then the Nautilus and etc, etc. I'm not impervious. I added the F77 from Nevada Grinch into my own collection, and that segues perfectly into the subject of revival brands. Over the last decade, we've seen many victims of the quartz crisis revived to cash in on the prestige of having Swiss made on the dial and something with a bit of heritage to the name. While there are countless examples of it being just marketing with lackluster offerings, please do share yours in the comments. Nevada Grenchen, in my opinion, is a prime example of a brand doing it right. So let's elucidate precisely why. Take this relatively newish release, the Vulcan Nautique, which is a skin diver, 200 meters water resistance and automatic with an ETA inside or Celita, I can't remember quite which, but essentially it's based on a classic model from the brand's illustrious past. It's a beautifully designed modern update that is handsome, very wearable, thanks to its slenderness. And just like the previous Hammy, extremely period faithful in dimensions and scale and thus ultimately versatile. The kind of thing enthusiasts like me absolutely adore and fall in love with. But this brand is also owned by the same chap who owns Nevada Grenchen. So why is this not a cash grab when so many brands like this are? I believe watches, the brands, uh, the people behind them should be judged on an individual basis. And the chap behind Volcain and Nevada Grenchen is a guy called Guillaume Ledet. Now, I had the honor and pleasure of meeting him last year at a uh, watch show in New York, and it was immediately obvious how passionate, how knowledgeable, uh, how much care and attention he puts into his watches. In fact, his passion was rather infectious, and that translates to the final product. 
He's considered a horturology industry veteran, and despite his young age, that begs the question, why not go high-end for more lucrative profit margins? For those who don't know, there's much more money in selling luxury watches than Volcane and Nevada Grenchen, which are considered entry level. Well, firstly, he's not gonna put his name to something he doesn't love and wear himself, or that is badly made. Recently, he successfully raised over a million bucks via Kickstarter to fund his Argon watch project. This avant-garde, super futuristic, completely original watch not only proves his understanding of watch design, but it also offers watch enthusiasts something that would have typically been only possible to produce via the high-end brands due to its use of materials and the mechanics involved to achieve how it functions. So therefore, to me at least, proving he's a man of the people and he wants more people to have better watches without having to pay an arm and a leg for them. In terms of negatives for the Nautique, I'm not a massive fan of the faux patina, but then that is just personal preference. But value-wise, it's a little bit on the expensive side, especially when you consider, albeit a much thicker watch, the iconic Squalet 1521, which is 500 meter water resistant, is also Swiss made and around 500 bucks less. At the time of this mini review, the Volcane is priced around 1600 bucks, and it has to compete with the best of the Seiko Pro level divers, as well as a COSC certified version of the 1521 with all the top grade trimmings, not to mention tons of other historic Swiss and German made offerings. With the watches we're looking at today, you don't get a sense that it's designed by committee. And I, I feel that's a big trap that especially a lot of the bigger brands fall into a bit like movies with terrible sequels to tick boxes uh, to maximize appeal to maximize profit not like i don't know a director's early work where it's the, the the motivation is to make great art to make a great movie you know not to please everybody and and to appease every taste and demographic and oh every wrist so take movie franchises like Jurassic Park, and if you're watching this, I'm sorry Hugo, that go from an innovative blockbuster classic, studied in film schools around the world, simultaneously entertaining on a basic level, but on another have profound social commentary, compelling lovable characters, and a fully fleshed out world, all culminating in something magical that keeps us coming back. The parallel between the big dumb fun cash grabs of yet another movie sequel to yet another unimaginative limited edition watch is undeniably accurate. The second one, I think, scraped out just over a billion worldwide, and then this third one uh, in the 900 millions. Okay. I wouldn't mind any of the stupidity as long as it was fun. Yeah, it was movie's, a slog. It's, the movie's a slog. But just because it's a big or well-established brand name does not always mean it can't be good. How frightfully rude. Don't they know I'm a trained Shakespearean actor? This is the new, for 2023, Bulliver Oceanographer GMT. Last year, Bulliver's owners at Citizen generated shockwaves in the watch world with the introduction of the new, true Traveler's GMT capable movement, the Calibre 9075, via their in house, or should I say in group, movement manufacturer, Miota. This affordable caliber will undoubtedly end up powering many of the affordable level micro brands that before would have to either choose more expensive Swiss ETAs, Soprods or Solitas, or go with cheaper quartz options to get that highly desired GMT hour hand that can set independently. So how to best utilize a new exciting era of affordable automatic GMTs? Well, Bulliver did what any brand that truly understands its own lineage and the watch enthusiast audience would do. They decided to include it on a new version of one of their most iconic divers from 1972, the Oceanographer, AKA, and rather whimsically named, the Devil Diver, due to its 666 feet water rating famously printed on the dial. Bulliver did a fantastic job here. It's a watch that's unique to them, it's very distinctive, but yet, 
you know, it's a logical progression of the oceanographer and a great way to implement a GMT. Let's not forget these were originally designed for the US military back in the 70s. And I think there's a real authenticity. They really took into consideration the heritage and also the opinions of the super collectors that I know they consult with on future designs, which is really, really cool. And that's a great way of doing it. Other brands take note. <laughs> The distinctive barrel style, brightly polished 41mm diameter case is reminiscent of the 1967 Doxa 330T. But the sector dial with the mini cylindrical crystals to emphasize the luminescence and legibility at extreme angles or distortions from the stunningly domed sapphire glass is unlike anything out there. The result is a highly usable diving capable GMT watch, perfect for travel but also pays homage, and I mean that in the truest sense of the word, to the Rolex GMTs that started it all, by including a bi-directional, fully loomed, rotating 24-click GMT bezel with the Pepsi color scheme. Also available is a root beer option, and even a high contrast monochrome version, which is definitely a strong nod to their own equally iconic Accutron Astronaut GMT of the 1960s. Its presidential, almost Speedmaster-esque bracelet is absolutely first class. Despite the pins and collar links, it adds a bit of charm and as well as being very comfy, it's an absolute joy to wear. The overall result is something original that offers decent value, but more importantly, a perfect marriage of function and heritage in something not done before. The furthest you could get from the empty gesture of a quick cash grab. Now, are there some negatives? Well, of course there are. No watch is perfect. Uh, the 19 millimeter lug width, yeah, I wish it was 20. Uh, what else? The uh, GMT hand could have been a smidgen bigger in my opinion. The stamped clasp, I wish it was a little bit more solid, but that's about it. Overall, definitely going to be, uh, I think, a winner with not just the fans, but I think it is gonna be a future classic. That's my prediction anyway. Now, the Hamilton, I believe, has already been released to coincide with the movie. Thank you to them for lending a sample in. Also, stay tuned for more Volcane. I will be covering that brand in the future. I really want to look at their alarm watches, their most famous iconic watch. And a shout out to the team at uh, Boulevard for so generously lending this GMT in. I believe it's a world premiere. Massive, massive thank you to them. That is released in August of 2023. Now compare this GMT to the Black Bay GMTs. Don't get me wrong, I absolutely love them. I think they're fantastic watches. And obviously, I'm a big fan of Tudor. But it is a collection that has become completely oversaturated, almost comedically so. Just slapping another snowflake hand on yet another Tudor feels far less inventive than their more daring discontinued North flag, for example. There's a reason I only ever design or co-design a handful of watches per year. Any more than that, and I feel it devalues my brand and any brand I'm working with. But these are watch brands, doing what watch brands should do, producing watches. It's no secret the entire industry is facing a far bigger, more deleterious and faster moving crisis than the quartz crisis of the 1970s with the ironically named smartwatch a wrist-worn extension of your smartphone, deliberately designed to be obsolete in just a few years, thus being maybe the biggest cash grab of them all. One that can even insidiously surveil you, monitor all kinds of stats about you, as if we're living in some kind of Charlie Brooker-esque Black Mirror nightmare. But perhaps what's worse, and to add more salt to the wound in the most stylish, pedestrian and derivative looking design. Now, all the watches included in this video, they have style, they have heritage, they have a story behind them, they have you know, a, a lineage of design. They can be elegant, but also functional, so functional at the same time. They can last a lifetime or even lifetimes can hand them down, they can be with you for life's adventures. They're not disposable technology that you have to replace. I'll be honest with you, this really sounds very snobby, but every time I see somebody with a smartwatch, I'm disappointed. I think in my mind, che schifo, che peccato, un altro burino senza stile, you know? I think I am finally a watch snob about something. 
Recently, I watched a truly excellent video by one of my favorite YouTubers, George Rockel Schmidt. He explored the detrimental effects of nepotism in today's society, its political, economic, cultural, and historical significance. But nepotism and generational access aren't the carrot and stick of dynastic interests and actions alone. Normal people are not only affected by nepotism, but are just as prone to it as the ruling class. While the watch world is by far not innocent when it comes to the downsides of nepotism, it can also be one of the few times that nepotism can actually be a good thing. Take the British brand Vertex, for example, and their outstanding M1000 series, based on watches made famous by being one of the original Dirty Dozen in World War II. But unlike the other 11 brands, it's the only one still under the ownership of the same family. By talking to Don Cochran, the current owner, it becomes abundantly clear he cares deeply about protecting, continuing and doing justice to his forefather's legacy. One that, lest we forget, played such an important role in the world's fight for freedom and so we don't have to click our heels every time we walk into a room. That fastidious care and attention is manifested in his watches, a brand I plan to explore fully in the coming months, so stay tuned. So in my opinion, what are the biggest cash grabs? And maybe this is because I'm a part-time watch YouTuber, if that's even a thing. To me, it's not the actual watch brands or the watches themselves, it's how they're reported on and how they are marketed. A few years ago, the biggest money grab was the so-called style influencers paid off by fashion watch brands and thus taking advantage of those without knowledge of watches with massively overpriced mass-produced rubbish. Today, YouTube has been hijacked by something far worse. Watch dealers with fake reviews, aspirational collector propaganda, or former enthusiasts destroying any journalistic integrity by becoming watch dealers themselves in order to cash in on that influence. As we all know, you can't review a watch and sell it too. It's never a real review. You can only do one or the other. This was started a few years earlier with the death of true watch journalism, publications becoming shilling platforms or watch dealers themselves, a line once crossed you can never go back on. So there we have it. Now, it's not all doom and gloom. The internet also empowers so many enthusiasts like myself. There's amazing channels and vlogs and blogs out there. Do check out my recommended list. And it's led by enthusiasts. It's about sharing it in a way that is informative, helpful, and having fun at the end of the day. So it, there's still so much great stuff out there. Uh, guys, you vote with your time and your money. Never forget that. Speaking of which, don't forget to like this video for more free and independent content like this. And I will catch you in the next one. Onwards and upwards. Ciao.